So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to the first virtual membership business meeting of the Fulbright Association, which I will now call to order. My name is Dee Dee Long, and I am the current chair of the Board of Directors. And on behalf of the 25 member board, we are so pleased that you have reserved this time today to hear a little bit about the health of the association as we wrap up 2020 and what is in store for 2021, which will mark the 75th anniversary of the signing of the legislation that created the Fulbright program. This year has been extraordinary by any measure. Every one of us has been deeply impacted directly or indirectly by the pandemic as it has affected every aspect of our life. International education has been redefined. The Fulbright program itself has had to shift and adapt in ways we could not imagine. But I am so proud to say that this association has shown tremendous resilience, adaptability, and nimbleness. By shifting to a digital reality, we had to learn how to govern by Zoom and our executive director and his team had to manage the work of the association from home. And in doing so, they were asked to rethink programming and we all learned the potential of bringing people together even when we can't get on airplanes. And as a consequence, we're all here today, completely accustomed to, connecting, to conducting our business in front of our computer. Uh, next slide, please, Munir. So I will turn your attention to our agenda today. We will be offering you a financial report from our wonderful treasurer, Will Vokey. You will then hear from our vice chair and chair of the strategic planning task force, Cynthia Baldwin, who will provide highlights of the 2021 to 2023 strategic plan just approved by our board last week. She deserves enormous praise for, for guiding that team through an arduous but very satisfying year long exercise. That will set the stage for our outstanding executive director to offer his perspective on 2020 and plans for 2021. As you think of questions that you would like for us to address, please feel free at any time to put them in the chat box so that we can respond to these during our Q&A following these presentations. And I think John Bader will be monitoring that chat box. But before I hand this off, no meeting I have ever attended of the Fulbright Association is complete without at least a few thank yous. Next slide, Munir. So I have, so I have to begin with the staff. Managing a nonprofit organization through tough economic times is one thing, but doing it from your basement during a global pandemic while being physically distanced from your team goes above and beyond. Today, we are strong and excited about our future because of the steady resolve and the fearless dedication of John Bader, Shaz Akram, Munir Sayeg, Naomi Guzman, and Christine Oswald. Thank you all so very, very much. The work of the board is also ongoing. Next slide, Munir. I have so enjoyed the congeniality of this group and so impressed by their commitment, dedication, and collective wisdom. But the sign of a healthy organization is the natural rotation of individuals stepping in to serve in this governance capacity. And so today, I want to acknowledge the good work of three individuals who are completing their elected terms at the end of this month. We are not saying goodbye because we will they will continue to be faithful alumni but we thank them deeply for the time and energy given to the board. Ashley Conard will be completing her PhD this year in computational biology at Brown University. Johanna Gussman, a staunch community activist, will not be short of ongoing work as a human rights lawyer. And this brings me to Mary Ellen Schmieder, who is a legend and an institution. Mary Ellen has dedicated many years of service to this association as a board member, a board president, interim executive director twice, and a chapter leader in Wisconsin. She has been recognized and received accolades often, but likely not often enough. She has made a lasting contribution to the vision of the Fulbright program and our role as an alumni association within the Fulbright global community. 
And naturally, she was already well ahead of the game much prior to the pandemic as an online adjunct faculty member. So she will continue to make her mark in education and our community. But turning to 2021, cha uh, change slides, Munia, please. And thanks to the outstanding work of our Governance and Nominations Committee, chaired this year by Carolyn Lavander, we are very pleased to welcome four newly elected individuals to our board starting in January. Julius E. Coles has an illustrious higher education career as an international affairs expert, serving institutions to, that include Morehouse College, the Andrew Young Center for Global Leadership, the Andrew Young Center for International Affairs, and Howard University. Leland Lazarus is a U.S. Foreign Service Officer and a social entrepreneur in his spare time. He, is, he completed his Fulbright in Panama in 2014 and is a very active member of the New York chapter. Kamala Raghavan is a Professor of Accounting and Finance in the JHJ School of Business at Texas Southern University and was a Fulbright Nehru Scholar in 2016-2017 at the Adani Institute for Infrastructure Management in India. And lastly, Reka Simarkenyi is a Senior Fellow and a past Executive Vice President at SIPA, the Center for European Policy Analysis. From 2015 to 2017, she was the Ambassador of Hungary to the United States. So I think you will all agree that this brings enormous and talent, uh, enormous talent and experience that will be reflected in the strategic work of our board over the next several years. Last slide, please. Or for me, at least. Um, lastly, and maybe most importantly, I want to extend my appreciation to the membership, to all of you. This includes chapter leaders, volunteers, our life members, our generous donors, our institutional members, our abruptly returned Fulbrighters who reached out to us last spring, and to all of you who have supported Fulbright scholars in this country this past year, our conference presenters, and all of you who have buried, buried our Fulbright store with orders in the last six months. Thank you so very much. We exist as an association because of your continued commitment to promoting mutual understanding and the Fulbright vision. And with that, I will conclude and I will pass this baton to Will Vokey, our treasurer. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Will Vokey, talking to you from Taiwan, where it is uh, 1.13 a.m. Uh, in the morning of Wednesday. Uh, we're going to talk about financials now, and there's way too much information to talk about. So I'm going to just give highlights. You have in front of you the two columns of expenses and revenue. The first column is this, this year from the beginning of the year to the end of October. And the second column is last year, 2019. A couple of points to make initially. First is that uh, the dramatic difference between 2019 and 2020. Basically, the years are not comparable because of COVID. Uh, second point to make is that for the first column, 2020 to uh, November 1st, uh, we have two more months to go before that year is done. And we are expecting those two months to be at a minimum a wash. Uh, we expect, in other words, not to run a deficit those two months. Uh, so the numbers should not be any worse than what you see here. And in fact, December is often a very good month for contributions, year-end contributions. So we're hoping that December will be better than a wash. And with that, that's my plea to all of you. If you have something in your budget uh, before Christmas or before the end of the year, please consider a donation contribution to the Fulbright Association. So let me quickly run through this. Essentially, every item in the revenue and expenses uh, Excuse me, let me start over again. Essentially, if you look at last year and you go down to the total expenses, you will see right under total expenses that we had a net of $111,000. That basically meant that we took no money out of the endowment. None of the income, none of the dividends were taken out of the endowment 
last year. Uh, we ended last year without taking out income with a $1,000 surplus. So last year was a great year. And in fact, for every year since John Bader has been executive director, we have taken no income or dividends out of the endowment, which is a normal practice for a nonprofit. So the endowment has been growing over the last several years. Second point to note is that if you go down to those same lines on the current budget from 2020 to November 1, you'll see that we are currently operating at $103,000 deficit, 812 in total expenses, $103,000 deficit. Actually, as the board was looking at this year, back in May, April, and June, we were expecting that the deficit might be even much worse than that. And we think actually that the deficit is going to be more in the neighborhood of 90,000 rather than 103,000. That is money that the board has authorized us to take out of the endowment on a one-time basis for this current year. So going down through all of those columns, you will see that essentially everything this year is down, both income and expenses, with exception of one category, under supporting services, general administration is up. And the reason for that is quite simple. During a normal year, you would be attributing some of the salaries to events that went on and to activities that went on, like the conference, other programming, travel, et cetera. That's not been possible this year. So those are the two columns that show last year and this year. We expect to end this year with a deficit in the neighborhood of $90,000. That $90,000 will be coming out of the endowment, which is under our bylaws, uh, something that we are allowed to do. Um, I don't wanna go into any more details on that, just to simply note that it's been a really tough year uh, we are down one staff member this year. We started the year with six. One staff member left to take a different job uh, and we decided not to replace her. So we are down one staff member. The staff has done a great job in keeping income up and keeping expenses down for this year. And I wanna publicly commend the staff for the great job that they've done this year. Um, it has been an extraordinary year. Um, so, I will leave that there and take any questions there might be. I'm sure there may be some questions on that. Next slide, please. So this is just a summary of our expenditures during 2020. You'll see that most went to program services, significant amount on general administration and some on fundraising. In a normal year, actually more would go to program services and the general administration would be down percentage-wise, up dollar-wise, but down percentage-wise, uh, because we would be having more programming. And John Bader is going to talk more about our programming next year when he comes up with his, uh, with his slides. Next slide, please. This is our revenue for this year. Our memberships are down, both individual and institutional. Um, if you have a friend who is a Fulbrighter, please encourage them to join. Uh, you can, might also encourage either the university that you are at, the institution you are at to join, or the one you came from. We are providing more and more services regularly to the universities who are members, and they are by far the largest number of institutional members. Grants this year were a significant part, were a, <clears throat> excuse me, were a significant portion. I will note that next year we are not expecting much in the way of grant money, if anything. Uh, that's because the State Department essentially spent all its funds this year uh, and our major grant has come in the past from the State Department uh, to help support our chapters around the country. Uh, the money that was spent this year was because of COVID and, and the State Department's budget, uh, we are told, has been exhausted. A um, Couple of more points to make then about next year. This has been an incredibly difficult year. As we look forward to next year, we have charged the, uh, the staff with a couple of things. One is to come up with a uh, balanced budget and the staff has prepared two budgets for next year. One budget will have a virtual year all year. The second budget will assume that we will begin programming in person sometime in October and perhaps even have travel programs. The first travel program might begin to Slovenia 
as early as June or July. Those two budgets both are lower than the budget for 2019 and both are higher than the budget for this year. So we are looking forward to a good year next year. We are keeping staff at the same size. We have increased our income by a very small portion in our budget. We're expecting three percentage increase. We actually hope it's much more significant than that. We actually had a very good year this year with membership and we hope that a number of you are new members and we wanna welcome you as new members. Uh, there was a census project going on in which we identified and recruited more than 1500 new members this year from Fulbrighters who had kind of been lost. Uh, so if you know any Fulbrighters who you were acquainted with in your tour who are not members, uh, please let them know about us and give us their email addresses. So we are expecting membership to uh, go up slightly next year. Again, we figured three percentage points on our uh, income for members and for donations. Uh, if we're going to have conferences and in-person activities, our expenses will go up, but our income will go up proportionally as well. So we're expecting next year to be a good year and we are expecting next year to begin to launch some more virtual activities that the staff has begun with this year, including some programs John is going to be talking about. I believe that's all I have, John, in terms of a revenue report. Let me make a summary then. Uh, this is the in-person and uh, this is the in-person budget and the uh, non-in-person budget for next year. You can see it's 101,200,000 for the in-person and 982,000 for the uh, uh, virtual budget for next year. That's the income side. Next slide. Next slide is the expense side. And you can see at the bottom, we're projecting slight surpluses for the year for either in-person or not in-person. Um, just a summary then, you can go to the next slide, uh, Munir, before I pass it over to Cynthia. Just in summary then, uh, this year was a bad year, uh, not as bad as it could have been and kudos to the staff. Uh, there will be money taken out of the endowment. We expect that to be a one-time thing. It's cushioned by the fact that we were putting money into the endowment the last four years. Uh, we expect next year to have in-person programming, but we are also planning for a virtual year if necessary, depending upon COVID. Finally, again, the appeal for members, institutional and individual, and for donations to help us through a difficult time. Thank you very much. Any, Cynthia, I believe, by the way, we are taking questions yeah. at the end. Let and me everyone... pass it on now to... Uh, Cynthia Baldwin, uh, Justice Baldwin. Hello, everyone. Hello, all Fulbrighters. I have had the privilege and the pleasure of serving as vice chair of the Fulbright Association Board for almost a year. When our current chair, Dee Dee Long, was elected as chair, one of the first things she tasked me with was chairing the strategic planning task force since our previous strategic plan was ending this month. The task force consists of board members, Ashley Connard, Gray Cooper, Bruce Fowler, Ann Lewis, and Mary Stanton, and executive director, John Bader. We began our work in earnest in March and the board approved the plan at its meeting just four days ago. The strategic planning process took into consideration the board survey, which had a 33% response rate of about 2,300 members, the interviews of over 40 stakeholders, including chapter leaders, commission directors, and donors, as well as the significant input of board members and staff. A lot of thought went into each section, mission, vision, value statement, goals, strategies, and performance indicators. The slides contain the mission, vision, and value statement. Is there a slide with those on it? 
Thank you. And you can see those before you and the three goals. The goals are uh, to build community among members, to strengthen the Fulbright program, and to improve and sustain the organization's financial performance. The strategies form the bases of the programs which will implement the goals. John Bader will share some of those with you and more detail will be provided next year. The performance indicators will provide the metrics by which we can measure our success. Strategic planning provides clarity, direction, and focus. It connects mission and vision in a plan. We believe this plan achieves that. Thank you for your attention. Please post any questions to chat to be answered later. And the next voice that you hear will be that of our executive director, John Bader. Hello, everyone. Yes, I am John Bader and the executive director of this great association and welcome to this conversation. I thought before I embarked on my presentation, I'd answer a few of your questions right now. Uh, and then we'll answer more as uh, uh, when, the, when the presentation is over. The first was a question about advocacy. Uh, we, uh, on a regular basis, advocate to the United States Congress to ensure that the Fulbright program is fully funded. Uh, our last advocacy ask, for example, was for $300 million for the uh, current appropriations. We do this on an ongoing basis. It's one of the reasons why we exist, uh, to, uh, to make sure that Congress understands this program and supports it. Someone asked a question about the 1946 Society. This is one of our giving groups uh, where uh, uh, folks support us on an ongoing basis. There's more information about our giving groups at our website, Fulbright.org, uh, and you can click on Donate. The benefits of institutional membership are many. We provide institutional members with a monthly uh, newsletter, which provides them information on the Fulbright program, on all kinds of uh, resources that they can use. We represent institutional members in our advocacy efforts. We promote the Fulbright program uh, and its awareness uh, by activities on campuses and through chapters. Uh, so that institutions and their faculty and students know more about the Fulbright program. And finally, we offer opportunities for them to post information uh, about job opportunities, as well as to promote their graduate and other programs through our communications. Uh, the service uh, trips that someone asked about, we hope to resume the travel program in 2021, but that is dependent on COVID conditions, and we will make, we will monitor those conditions and um, and communicate with you as we do that. Um, someone asked about the endowment, uh, so we have three endowments. They um, they are the first one is uh, supports the Cohen Dance Program that is worth about three hundred thousand dollars at the moment. Um, we have an endowment that supports the Fulbright Prize. That is worth 1.5 million at the moment. And our operating endowment, which is called the 21st Century Fund, is now worth approximately $2.5 million. Uh, these are professionally managed. Um, and uh, the investment strategy is determined by the board and the finance committee um, in a way that is balanced um, and prudent, but uh, also confident. Uh, like a lot of uh, institutions, our uh, endowment dipped a bit uh, in March and April, but has made a strong recovery as with uh, other stock market uh, performances. I'll get to uh, other questions uh, later, but if I could have the next slide, please, Manir. My role today is to offer you a preview of what's going to happen next year which is the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright program. We are very excited to join the Fulbright community worldwide in celebrating this extraordinary moment in US history and global history. 
Um, it is a moment of celebration, connection, and impact. We are looking to tell stories and to share memories and to think about the future in ways that are as connecting as they are dynamic and inspirational. Uh, we will be doing a number of things to celebrate the 75th. Uh, we will be asking all of you to share your stories of partnerships and friendships, asking you to share your photographs and memories so that we can begin to gather and share the collective experience of Fulbright uh, worldwide. Uh, if someone asked a question about chapter events. We hope that in-person chapter events will recommence in the fall and therefore chapters will be able to celebrate uh, the 75th anniversary. Uh, chapters are already offering digital programming, which is very exciting. And of course that will be available throughout this year. Uh, we will be offering our uh, conference, our annual conference on the Fulbright Prize as part of the 75th anniversary. That should take place in late October, we hope in person. Um, Fulbright in the Classroom will be expanding, and I'll get more on that in a minute, as well as the Fulbright Forum. Uh, again, I'll explain more of these in the coming slides. Next slide, please. So our prize should be taking place in, as I mentioned, in late October in Washington. Uh, we hope to pair the conference with the prize. Um, conference proposals will be announced in the spring, and we hope to offer that, as I said, uh, either in person, uh, and if, but if conditions do not allow, then a hybrid or even fully digital. Next slide, please. So Fulbright in the Classroom is our primary way that we reach out to the community to share the Fulbright experience. Uh, we are expanding this program, which has been running for three years very successfully, to reach uh, community colleges and um, uh, four-year colleges. We, have, we hope to have a special focus on underrepresented communities. Uh, so we'll be reaching out to HBCUs and rural communities and, um, and many other uh, locales. Um, participation will be uh, local, in person, digital, or both, depending on uh, pandemic conditions. And we're also pleased to announce that thanks to the support of the Van Otterloo Foundation, we will be offering a new grant program that we will be uh, uh, rolling out in the spring. So we look forward to your participation in Fulbright in the Classroom. Next slide. The Fulbright Forum is a new digital program that will offer content on a regular basis uh, throughout the year so that we can share content with each other uh, outside of, of our extraordinary conference. Uh, it will focus primarily on international topics. I've given a few examples right here. Um, but uh, we're looking forward to your suggestions for what those might be. And of course, your participation in those conversations as they go forward. There will always be, as with many of our events, opportunities for partnerships with institutions, with foundations, with other nonprofits, as well as the chance to sponsor these programs and to raise the profile of our supporters. Next slide. These last two slides are a, a short list of the ways that you can become more involved and that will end our presentation and we'll take questions and uh, enjoy a discussion. Um, the first suggestion is to propose a conference presentation or a poster. We are dependent on you and your amazing experiences, your research, your insight, uh, your stories to enliven and enrich our conference. We hope you will participate by submitting a proposal. Uh, I mentioned that uh, chapters are offering digital programming. You can be involved in that, either as a leader of a, uh, of a chapter, and many of you are, on this, uh, on this webinar, uh, but also those of you who have not been very involved in your chapter. Uh, our chapter list is on our website under chapters, and you can always contact us at info at fulbright.org to learn more. Uh, advocacy, uh, I mentioned the importance of advocacy to our mission and to the continued health of the Fulbright program moving forward. We will be doing that digitally during the month of April and in the spring, early spring, we'll be inviting you to register to, to participate 
from your own living room or office or you know your couch uh, in digital conversations with members of Congress and their staff. Very important that you participate. We're especially keen on getting more participation from the middle part of the country, uh, from areas that uh, have not been well represented here, the mountain states and so on. Um, so we look forward to your involvement digitally in April. I mentioned the, the Fulbright in the Classroom. Again, we hope you will volunteer to reach out and share your experiences with school children and college students around the country. It's so important that we share our knowledge and love of, of the world. You can attend our events. So there's the Fulbright Forum. We'll be offering a TEDx Fulbright uh, in late August. These are the TED Talks that you've become familiar with as well as the conference and prize, which I've mentioned. Okay, next slide. And a few other suggestions. You can start a new chapter or become a chapter leader. We are so grateful to all of you who are chapter leaders in our 55 chapters across the country, but there are, there are 15 states that have no chapter whatsoever. And there are also, of course, many chapters whose location is in one area, but you're in another. So we're, we'd be happy to support you as we start another chapter uh, or many more chapters. Um, one thing you look forward to is that we're offering more resources for our individual members. Uh, the Great Decisions uh, is a program offered by the Foreign Policy Association in partnership with us. We hope to offer these discussion-based uh, uh, information so that you can meet and chat and learn. You could sign a petition or write to Congress as part of our springtime uh, advocacy work. You can tell others to join FA and get involved as, uh, as Will Vokey has suggested. Uh, you can promote institutional membership to your college university organization. We've just talked about that. You can donate to support our mission. We always welcome uh, uh, donations of any size. It's important that folks uh, feel connected to our mission and support it financially, and we're grateful. And finally, submit your photos and stories to celebrate the 75th. That will be very important. We want all countries, all age groups, all uh, programs to be represented, and you can make that happen. Okay, final slide. All right, um, we are happy to take your questions. We'll all unmute um, and take your questions and comments. Uh, let me go to the chat function here and find. Um, okay, so let's see um, how to start a new chapter. Um, so uh, starting a new chapter is starts with reaching out to our office. If you could just contact info at Fulbright.org. We have a team that is there to help you walk through the process of putting a chapter together. Uh, this generally involves starting with identifying a group of people who could serve on the local board and, and, and be the leaders for that particular chapter. We'll provide you with a variety of technical support and logistical support all the way. Uh, so we're here to help you. That's one of our main jobs. Um, uh, let's see, another question is about the Van Otterloo uh, gift. I'm, I'm afraid uh, Dee Dee, Cynthia, and Will, I'll just, uh, I, I may need to answer some of these myself, so uh, uh, forgive me. Um, so the Van Otterloo uh, Foundation is a family foundation. Um, uh, we're very excited to have their, uh, their support. Um, they have given us a $20,000 grant for us to give out small uh, grants to digi uh, for digital presentations for the Fulbright in the Classroom project. Uh, this is an exciting new part of our strategic plan um, and uh, we're hoping to expand that significantly, but the Van Otterloo family has helped us get started and that is really exciting and we're grateful to them. Uh, another question here about volunteering for the Fulbright in the Classroom. I'm glad there's interest in that. You can go to our website under Programs and look under Fulbright in the Classroom. There you'll see lots of um, toolkits 
for uh, managing Fulbright in the classroom. And then you can write to me directly, john at fulbright.org. I'm happy to, to talk to you about getting involved in the program. And uh, as we roll out this new grant, now that we've just received this, so we're, we're developing the application process as we speak. Uh, so we're looking forward to, uh, to that. Um, so please contact us at any time. Um, Let's see, Dee Dee, are you seeing a question that uh, yeah, you'd like to ask? Um, I, well, I picked up on a question earlier. Um, Please. There's just a lot of people who really have enjoyed our virtual conference um, because they got to participate. Uh, maybe they haven't been able to attend a physical conference. And the question was, you know, if we have a physical conference, will, it, will, we, will we be able to offer a virtual opportunity for people to participate. And yeah, I don't think there's any turning back. I think um, we, we have to find a way to include everyone um, because it brings such a rich uh, diversity to the conference attendees. Um, so if we go physical, we'll also have an opportunity, if you don't mind me saying, I mean, yeah. is, we'll make it possible for people to participate virtually. Exactly, that's very exciting. And uh, I was so pleased at how many younger uh, Fulbrighters were involved in our in our conference, and of course I understand that it's expensive to fly to Washington and get a hotel and register and all that stuff. I, I appreciate that. Um, so Dee Dee is exactly right. We want to be more inclusive and more digital. Very excited about that. Uh, there's a there's a question here for Will. Um, how does it come to be that you're in Taiwan? And tell us more about uh, what's going on in Taiwan. Uh, there's some political questions there that uh, may yeah. be a better for an, for an offline question, but uh, tell us more about who you are and why you're in Taiwan. I retired after nine years as executive director of the commission in Taiwan uh, and have retired mostly here in Taiwan. Um, so that's, that's why I'm in Taiwan. Um, Taiwan is uh, the climate here uh, threats from the PRC to Taiwan are an ongoing daily occurrence and everybody's uh, accustomed, acclimated uh, to them. Uh, and uh, it's something you simply live with when you're here. Nobody actually believes there is going to be anything that happens, uh, but people are prepared. Uh, I should mention, by the way, Sorry about that. Taiwan has probably done the best job in the world on COVID. Um, and I've been out to dinner at restaurants seven nights in a row. Um, so uh, y'all come. <laughs> um, let's talk about, uh, let's see, there was a question here about, um, hold on, let me just see. Um, that the, again, oh, finding out about Fulbrighters in your area. So we, we're we very excited to, to uh, inform you that they're in the, in, your, in the membership portal, which you have used to log on to register for this very, um, this very event, um, you will find a digital uh, directory. And that directory uh, can be searched locally or uh, nationally, and you can see the people who are in your area. Let's say you live in Bozeman, Montana, my favorite uh, example. Um, there are eight Fulbrighters in, in Bozeman, and you guys can contact each other. It's, uh, you can use the directory and reach out to each other. Um, it's brilliant. So we don't, you don't have to have a chapter. You don't have to have us to help you. You can use the directory within our system. So that's if exciting. I might suggest, John, um, there is also an app called the Fulbrighter app, yes. which you can join and which connects Fulbrighters not only in the United States, but around the world. It is just being developed and is not heavily populated at this point, but it is an idea that when you travel, if we ever travel again, uh, you would be able to go to uh, Budapest and identify Fulbrighters in Budapest who perhaps shared the same interests you do. That's exactly and that's right. called the Fulbrighter app. Look it up right. in the app store. 
Exactly right. And there's also information about that on our own uh, on our own website. So you can check that out as well. Um, John, there, there are ahead, a number of questions, or at least I've seen a couple, um, looking for updates on the program itself. Um, and I mean, this is a little out of since we're not directly responsible for the running of the program, um, you're in conversation, I know a lot with um, ECA and um, just wondered if you might at least address that question a little bit. Sure, Will, why don't you handle that? I think uh, you may have a, uh, as, as good a view of this as I do, but I'm happy to weigh in. My understanding is that uh, there was a question about extensions my understanding is that there will not be extensions. Um, all the full, most of the full riders for this current year are leaving uh, after the beginning of the year, after January 1, and we'll have essentially uh, a half year or perhaps nine months uh, in sight, depending upon what their program was. Um, so I don't believe there will be extensions. And I don't think there were extensions last year of last year's grantees. Um, but that's my understanding. I've been out of the executive directorship for a year now and things may have changed. One of the challenges, sorry, Dee Dee, go ahead. No, just from an institutional perspective, um, I'm here in Fayetteville, Arkansas and very, um, used to be very, uh, well, used to be employed by the University of Arkansas. And um, I just can say that even when scholars and students haven't been able to travel, there's quite a bit of virtual uh, training going on between um, Fulbright grantees, so the, the grants that they were bringing visiting scholars into the country that couldn't travel, they've offered a lot of programs um, virtually. So there, there's, a, there's a lot of um, cognitive mobility going on um, between students and scholars and um, faculty I, I'm not as aware of, uh, but they're trying their best to maintain momentum in the program until uh, we're back to normal travel. I believe that's what I know. I'm gonna pose my own question to Cynthia. Um, Cynthia, if you could tell us what is uh, of the uh, initiatives of the um, new strategic plan, what most excites you about some of the things that we're planning to do in the next three years? If you could uh, share a bit of your love and enthusiasm for what we've got planned. <laughs> Well, you know, it doesn't take much to excite me about Fulbright. I stay excited about Fulbright. <laughs> but I do have to mention that um, when we were talking about the digital programs, that's part of our strategic plan and in the, in the programming that would be um, uh, digital in nature so that we want people to be involved because the strategic plan is all about inclusiveness now. And so that's really good. And that's why uh, programs like Fulbright in the classroom, and I see that there have been a lot of questions on Fulbright in the classroom and, and wanting to volunteer for a Fulbright in the classroom. So um, that's what excites me. The other thing, John, I noticed in the questions is that people are wondering whether the slides are available to, to be posted so that they can see the slides. And I think that that would be very, very helpful. Sure, we're happy to do that. And we'll, we're also recording this very presentation and we'll make that available to the membership as well. Uh, there have been a couple questions about politics and how the Fulbright Association situates itself politically. And uh, that's a delicate question and I'll try to answer it delicately. Um, we have lived in a very combative and difficult uh, political environment as well known. You don't need me to, to summarize that. Um, but the challenge that we have faced is the critical and historic importance of the Fulbright Association's role in advocating for the Fulbright program itself. We try to stay very focused on that important mission so that the Fulbright program is funded and strong and remains a priority in the State Department and elsewhere. That has, uh, of course, focused our strategy on building bipartisan relationships, building up our relationship at the grassroots level so that members of, of both chambers and both parties 
understand and appreciate both the global impact of a Fulbright and its local impact, whether it's in inbound grantees, uh, bringing resources and money to American communities across this country, or um, uh, returning Fulbrighters, uh, like many of us, uh, bringing expertise and experience and so on. Uh, so that has, that has required that we be very disciplined about what issues we become engaged with and staying focused on a, a bipartisan mes message of a stronger Fulbright. Um, so uh, thank you for understanding that particular uh, perspective and strategy. Um, John, if I, if I might, John, on um, the advocacy side, yes. uh, I think perhaps most of our members know that under the Trump administration, the executive branch proposed cuts in full, full right funding ranging from 39% to 79%, depending on which year it was. And that in each case, uh, Congress uh, on a bipartisan basis restored that funding. And in fact, la the last year, Congress provided a small increase, which we are happy to take credit for at the Fulbright Association uh, from our advocacy, although we have no proof that that was the case. Oh, come on. <laughs> so, so and, and we can expect in this budget environment with the amount of money the federal government has put in the COVID uh, relief packages, uh, that, that Fulbright will continue to be uh, under some financial pressure from the uh, federal government. Uh, I should also note that the commissions around the world, there are 49 commissions, raise about $100 million locally, which is essentially the equivalent of um, a third of the current Fulbright budget uh, locally for Fulbright commissions from their local governments and from the uh, local donors. So advocacy is a really crucial ongoing piece that, that we need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead, Cynthia. John, yes, John, I, I saw a question about the plan and the updating of the membership on the strategic plan. Sure. And I just wanted people to know that that we do plan to send it out in summaries. Is that correct? So That's that correct. people do know um, what the plan and we will continue to update them on what's going on under the plan. Of course. Um, so this, uh, this session today is just a, a primer, a, 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 re a reminder that we have been doing that for the past year. And in the first quarter, we'll roll this out so that you see more details and, and know more about our strategic priorities moving forward. Absolutely. John, um, there's a question about how many full-time employees in their roles. Um, there are five people. Could you explain each's basic duties? Sure, sure. Um, uh, as Will suggested, there are five of us. Um, I, I, I'm one of those five. As executive director, my responsibilities go toward planning, uh, execution, fundraising, advocacy, program support, um, board liaisons. I also work with chapters and institutions and partners across the, uh, the country and across and around the world. Um, our deputy director, Shah Zakram, is primarily responsible for our events. Uh, she works very hard to launch our conference, our prize, TEDx Fulbright. She also works very closely with chapters. Um, and she's involved in um, uh, many other projects uh, throughout the year. Uh, Munir Sayah is our communications uh, director. He is responsible for um, uh, our newsletters, our collaborations with, uh, with, with other um, institutions. He's responsible for social media. Um, he also works very hard on uh, membership data. Uh, Munir has been the leader of our Fulbright Census project for the last number of years, which has identified more than 60,000 Fulbrighters who had no contact information. Uh, Naomi Guzman is our uh, development manager. She helps me uh, work with donors and uh, uh, both large and small throughout the year, campaigns that we offer, uh, uh, gift programs that we have, uh, giving programs, et cetera. Um, Christine Oswald is our uh, program and chapter manager. 
She works very hard to uh, work with, with uh, our members, helping uh, all of you, works uh, to support chapter leadership across the country. She also uh, runs our institutional and membership campaigns. Um, did I forget anybody? I think that's it. Um, yeah, great team, love these guys. Uh, fantastic uh, group of folks. I enjoy working with them and they have been super in this last year working remotely. It is very challenging to work in this environment as I'm sure all of you know. And they have stuck together and worked hard and collaborated. It's, it's been a joy to watch and support and lead them. John, there are several questions about chapters and what's going to happen with chapter grants okay. next year. Well, our hope is that there will be a chapter grant for the next fiscal year, starting in the fall. Um, at the moment, as Will suggested, the State Department uh, does not have funds available at the moment. And of course, we do not have any in-person events that we can offer at the, either the national or the chapter level. So we are hoping that those conditions change as 2021 moves on and we're able to find resources from state that they can support the kinds of activities that all of you are accustomed to. I have, a, I have high confidence that will happen because uh, the State Department and the, Ful the, For the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board, the FFSB, is very keen on properly celebrating the 75th anniversary. Uh, and they know that chapters and local alumni will make that happen and will make that much brighter. And therefore, they need support to do that. So I'm, I'm confident that the, the conditions will improve and we'll be able to offer a chapter grant. Uh, let's see, other questions in the, in the few minutes that we have left. Any, the three of you see any that you think we should that we can John, um, I think that it would be interesting because I see, uh, I saw a question about the Fulbrighters who might be in the 117th Congress. And I think it would be interesting to tell people that you always do a search to see the Fulbrighters. We that, certainly uh, do. We, uh, we scan uh, incoming uh, members of Congress for their Fulbright affiliation. At the moment, there are two members of the House, John Sarbanes and Tom Cole who are Fulbright alumni, uh, Sarbanes from Maryland, Cole from Oklahoma. One's a Democrat, one's a Republican, just as it should be. Um, and, uh, but what's interesting and, and important is that there are hundreds of Fulbrighters who are on the staff on Congressional, on, on Capitol Hill. We run into them all the time. Uh, uh, for example, one of the senior members of, um, um, uh, Chris, uh, uh, Senator Coons' uh, office. He's, she's, uh, she's a Fulbrighter. We love her. Um, so there's a lot of connection. There's a lot of connection on Capitol Hill thanks to the Fulbright Network. Um, John, if I, if I might here before we end, I wanted to make please. a point to the members that are still with us that uh, this association plays a crucial role in the orbit of Fulbright. There are local governments, national governments, binational commissions, uh, cooperatives like the Institute of International Education that help man minister the program, the Department of State. But this is the only voice for advocacy in the world for Fulbright. Uh, and it's crucial that it continue because we are going into an era, in my belief, in which the vision of Fulbright is going to become increasingly important as we move into a more nationalistic, more hard power, more um, less multilateral world. And I think that's gonna happen even with President Biden. So uh, I would encourage everyone to think hard and long about what the right can play. Yeah, let me, let me build on that and, and suggest that there, there's no guarantee of anything. Uh, a, a number of you may be encouraged by uh, the return of a democratic president, but that's, but in fact, if you go back in time, democratic administrations have often looked to cut Fulbright in order to fund other priorities. Right. Um, uh, it's also critical to know that it, regardless of the position that the president takes on Fulbright, which of course we hope is encouraging and supportive, Members of Congress are the ones who are making appropriations decisions. 
and the knowledge of the Fulbright program it continues to struggle because there's turnover in Congress and lots of new staffers who know nothing about the Fulbright program. So we need your help and engagement for that. Um, one quick footnote, uh, Mary Ellen Schmieder, our, uh, our illustrious outgoing board member, she pointed out that Mark Kelly, the new Senator from Arizona is married to a Fulbrighter, that's Gabby Giffords. Uh, and of course, all of us are huge Gabby fans. Um, so uh, well, well put, uh, Mary Ellen. Um, any final comments from the three of you as we, as we uh, close down this very, uh, uh, very useful and, and fun membership meeting? I am glad that we had so many people who gave of their time to come to this meeting. And it talks about the interest in Fulbright. So yes, that should be applauded. And so I'm excited about that. And I am going to leave now because distance learning is calling me. <laughs> Goodbye, Cynthia, teacher. Goodbye, Cynthia. She, takes, she teaches her, her, her grandson, Isaiah, so that she has to go. Anything, yeah. Didi or Will? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, um, while virtual works really well, and I'm so glad we were able to um, have your questions and your considerations and your great comments. Um, the, the, the sad part about it is in a normal business meeting, we'd be all getting up, going to the coffee bar and continuing the conversation. Um, and we can't do that today, but I'm, I will be reviewing the chat. I'm sure the staff will be reviewing the chat to make sure that we didn't, if we missed stuff, I'm sure we missed things and I'm sure there's uh, uh, things on your mind, um, but we'll follow up. We'll try to do the best we can to communicate out, um, but reach reach us, we're, we're available. We're all over the place, um, but we're easy to find. So I, I just want to encourage um, open communication and access. Um, very, very glad to see so many of you here today. Will, any final word? No, just to uh, stay with us through the next year. We appreciate your attendance today, your support as members, as donors. We wish you all the best for, for the holidays. Hope that you stay safe and healthy in this uh, pandemic. Uh, we're so glad to be uh, with you today. So take care and thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks everyone.